Welcome back. 2024 Democratic presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. joins me. Nice to see you. Good to see you. Good to be back with you, Greta. Thank you. I want to talk to you about foreign policy, but first, because I just want to come off the news tonight, I don't think there's one family in this country that hasn't been touched by alcohol and by drugs. Hunter Biden is the perfect example. Um, it's, it's not whether he has a drug problem or an alcohol problem. It's a question that President Biden has says that he trusts him. He's done nothing wrong. And does, is that a political liability uh, for the president going into this election or not? You know, Greta, I haven't been following the story with the, uh, you know, with the kind of attention that a lot of people have, and I haven't read the indictment. I haven't read the. I certainly haven't read the settlement, which I think was just announced a couple of hours ago. I was listening with uh, with real fascination to the questions that you and your guests raised about the issue. Um, but I don't think that uh, my uninformed speculation will add anything to the debate. Okay, then let's go to foreign policy. Um, all right, let me start with China. Um, if you're elected president, is your China policy, what would be sort of your, your uh, thought about, about China? Would it be a different foreign policy than the current Biden administration, or would it be something a little bit different? How do you see China? Well, I think there are, you know, first of all, I think that China is interested in world domination, but I don't think China wants to fight us, to, to confront America on a military uh, battlefield, on a military landscape. I think it's projecting economic power around the country. We have 800 bases around the world. China has one, one and a half. We spend three times more than China on our military, and we spend more than the top 10 nations combined. China doesn't want a war with us, but it does want to compete with us, and it wants to dominate us on the economic landscapes. I'm not scared of that kind of confrontation. I think America, with our freedom in this country, with our uh, what, what uh, Franklin Roosevelt called America's industrial genius, our, uh, our entrepreneurial spirit, we can compete with, with China and anywhere in the world as long as we stop spending all of our money, wasting our money, on our on these military expenditures that are bankrupting our middle class, destroying our industrial base, rather de-escalate the military conflicts, the saber rattling, reject economic power. As it turns out, people like it. We've spent 8.1 trillion dollars since 2000 universities and hospitals, and as it turns out, it's a better way of making friends around the world. People want to deal with China because they like the nose strings attached, investments in their economies. We ought to be competing on that landscape and not on, you know, and not just restricting well, what, our competition to the military. We ought to be de-escalating. And I think there's people in the White House now who want a war with Taiwan, and that's not a good thing for anybody. That will be World War III. How do we turn this around, though? Because we've got China developing some sort of spy satellite uh, base in Cuba, discussion about that. They've had a spy balloon go over the United States. They're saber rattling in Taiwan. Um, they've got that hypersonic missile that, we, that can evade our defense system. We have nothing to protect ourselves from. So, you know, we all want to de-escalate. How do you actually get people to de-escalate? How do you get President Xi Jinping to say, you're right, let's de-escalate, you know, we'll stop doing this? Well, you know, we have, we're building military bases and have a huge military presence in the South China Sea. Of course, China is going to feel justified putting uh, a military presence in our hemisphere. And, you know, when, when in 1962, when Khrushchev put missiles in Cuba, he did that because we had put missiles, Jupiter missiles, in Turkey. And as soon as my father, my uncle, met with Ambassador Joe Brennan, and said to him, we will remove our nuclear missiles from, from Turkey if you remove them from Cuba. Uh, Khrushchev did so. So I think, you know, th there's no guarantees that the Chinese will, will end their presence in our hemisphere, the military presence, if we agree to do something to de-escalate over there. I think there's a good chance they will, and we won't know until we at least sit down and negotiate with them about these issues, and that's what we need to do. We've refused to negotiate with Russia about anything, you know, and when you do that, you cast your adversary as an enemy, as somebody who can't even be talked to. It is a formula for war. war. And, you know, my uncle understood that. He said, you've got to be able to put 
yourself in the shoes of your adversary and understand their cultural, their, their national security interests, their national security anxieties, their cultural and, and historical perspective. And until we start doing that and talking to people who are our adversaries, we're not going to de-escalate. But I believe the world wants to de-escalate. And everybody in the world, it, nobody wants a war between Russia and the United States. And we don't need one. And we can fight them on an economic landscape, and we can prevail. Do you worry about this? I mean, what we've, what we've just talked about is there's a hardware war. I mean, you know, we're sell, we sell weapons all over the world. And, and, you know, and I realize everyone's sort of building up, uh, you know, different countries building up. But what, what I worry about is, is a WMD like a virus, like a gain of function. Something, do, you, do you worry about that? Because I see that as sort of the next, the next big fight. Because, you know, those viruses don't see any borders. And, uh, and they're relatively cheap to do this gain of function. I mean, it's just so, you know, that's what I worry about more than the big hardware. Yeah, you're exactly right. And we know that the Chinese are developing ethnic bioweapons, bioweapons that are designed to attack people of certain racial types. And, the, and we're doing the same thing. We've been collecting Chinese DNA We've been collecting Russian DNA specifically for that. It, it, this arms race is a ca catastrophe. You know, in 1969, we, we had developed by then nuclear equivalency with bioweapons. So we could eliminate the same numbers of people with bioweapons at, I think, 29 cents a death. They calculated, the Defense Department was, and the CIA calculated at that time. And President Nixon did the most extraordinary thing. He went to Fort Detrick and he said, we are unilaterally ending the bioweapons arms race. We are giving up all of our bioweapons. We're going to destroy them. We're going to disable the capacity at Fort Detrick and we're not going to make them anymore. And three years later, almost all the nations on the earth signed a charter stopping bioweapons production. And, and the, the problem was, the CIA continued to do secret bioweapons production in our country. The Russians found out about that and rejigged their program. And then after 2001, we passed the Patriot Act, which reopened the arms race, which basically canceled out Nixon's 1979 agreement treaty and launched a new bioweapons arms race, and everybody else in the world is doing it. And, and the impacts, as you point out, Greta, are horrific. We need to stop it. We need to go all, to all those nations, and we need to say to them, let start, get rid of all the bioweapons. I give you one other issue that is really frightening to me: is AI. Um, you know, Elon Musk said AI first it's going to take our jobs, then it's going to kill us. We cannot allow the uncontrolled development of AI around the world. We need to be negotiating with Russia, with the Chinese, with the Iranians. We need to stop the wars, stop the saber rattling, and negotiate directly with them to figure out how we are going to have treaties in place that control this out of control AI development that is an existential threat to all of us. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because I was going to say to you before I say goodbye, I want you to come back and talk about AI because I'm working on, on many more things related to AI in terms of, of covering this news. So I know you have a foreign, a foreign policy speech tonight, so good luck with that. But I do want you to commit to coming back to talking about AI. Absolutely. Anytime, Greta. Anyway, thank you, sir. 2024 Democratic presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy, Jr. Thank you, sir. Thank you. back with you on a Friday for a special rising exclusive interview with 2024 Democratic presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. He joins us now. Welcome to Rising. Thank you so much for having me. 
Yeah, we so appreciate it. Uh, so many questions we want to get to, so let's kick it right off uh, with COVID. So friends of our show, Michael Schellenberger and Matt Taibbi, reported the other day that the earliest COVID patients actually did come from the Wuhan lab. They were scientists there. If this is confirmed, it would all but guarantee the lab leak theory, which I believe you've said in the past you also think uh, COVID originated from a Chinese lab. If that is the case, I want to know, will you prosecute Fauci and hold others criminally responsible in the U.S. health apparatus who advocated and funded gain-of-function research? Uh, I think I'm going to have to look at that, but I think they should be prosecuted. I think um, it was you know, reckless endangerment. Uh, they knew, you know, these all of these labs, including the Wuhan lab, had a history of leaks. Uh, there were numerous memos from the State Department and others saying that the lab was dangerous. It wasn't even a BSL-4 lab that they were doing these this research in. It was a BSL-2, BSL-3 labs that have, uh, you know, have very, very low thresholds and have, have uh, and this kind of research is malpracticed to do it in the labs that the, the actual scientists who got ill, who they're now saying is patient one, is Ben Hu, who was the underling for the bat lady for Xi Zheng Li, and his funding and her funding came directly from NIH, and NIH taught them the technology for developing, not only for, uh, for making the technology that was used to make these viruses more infectious, uh, more virulent, more deadly, but also the, this technology called the seamless ligation technique, which is just a bioweapons technique for concealing human tampering on engineered viruses. And uh, it was utterly irresponsible to be teaching anybody that. They should not have developed that technique in the first place. It's the inverse of everything that mm. you would do if you actually were interested in public health. Mm. It's just um, it's bioweapons technology. So sticking with COVID just for one more minute here, uh, President Biden obviously mandated vaccines for millions of workers before the Supreme Court struck that down. President Trump presided over Operation Warp Speed uh, to have government funding to get the vaccines off the ground. How would your administration have handled vaccines differently in terms of mandates and government funding for them. What did those two individuals do that you would have done differently? They did almost everything wrong. They, you know, first of all, they shouldn't have locked down society. We now know and we knew back then that it would be cataclysmic, that it would cause far more injury and economic costs, long-term economic costs, $16 trillion it's going to cost our country over the long run. It shifted four trillion dollars in wealth from the middle class in our country to this new, you know, uh, uh, oligarchy of billionaires. We created a billionaire day during the pandemic. All of the pandemic response preparedness protocols that have been developed for decades, in fact, almost for a century, all said unanimously: you do not lock down societies. You keep them open. You quarantine the sick, you protect the vulnerable, you keep society open, and then you focus on therapeutic drugs, drugs with proven safety histories. And that's what we should have done. It would have been much more effective to give people even vitamin D and to lock them down and wait for a vaccine that we now know. You know, the Cleveland Clinic study just came out, a new version of the study yesterday that shows that the more vaccines that you got, the more likely you are to get COVID. This is what the science is saying. That's 56,000 employees of Cleveland Clinic, a, you know, a, a, a major large study is showing the vaccine not only doesn't work, but it works opposite of what we were told that it was going to work. We should have focused on the, the therapeutic remedies that actually work. It's things like Zithromax, hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin, uh, the countries that use those had much better records. We, our protocol gave us the worst body count from COVID on earth. So doing everything that our government told us to do, we racked up 16% of the COVID deaths globally. We only have 4.2% of the population. The countries that used ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine, countries like Nigeria didn't even have a pandemic. We were told they were going to suffer terribly because of their poverty. Instead, they had a death rate one two hundredth 
of the death rate we had in this country. And you can look across the globe, the countries that adopted our protocols did the worst in terms of COVID deaths, COVID mortalities. The countries that did the opposite, that employed ivermectin, employed hydroxychloroquine. Nigeria had a 1.3% vaccination rate, mm. and it had 14 deaths per million population. We had 3,000 deaths per million population, of course. It was a war on the poor. The poor suffered and shouldered the burden of, of mm. these protocols more than any other parts of our population. Well, to, well, that's a good segue to our next question. Go well, ahead, to Brianna. Your, to your point, actually, about uh, the aggregation of wealth that happened during the pandemic and how it disproportionately, uh, the, the economic burden was on the poor, and 60 uh, the billionaires, millionaires and billionaires' uh, wealth increased by 64 percent in the context of the pandemic. And so I want to put to you, uh, a majority of Americans support a wealth tax for that reasons and others. You've described how much better the economic system was, the cultural, the culture of your youth was in the, the period between the war and the 1980s. Uh, would you support the kind of taxation that also existed back then when there were uh, more taxes levied on the very wealthy? My plan, Brianna, is not to change the overall tax burden. I'll, I will shift the burden around. I don't know exactly how I'm going to do that. Uh, I know that I will restore the uh, the child tax credits, and uh, and so the burden will shift. But I'm not going to raise the overall burden on taxes for Americans. So Biden committed to not raising taxes on uh, people who made less than $400,000 a year. Are you saying that you wouldn't raise taxes on anyone, including those uh, like the billionaire tax, which is extremely popular, and others who make well over $400,000 a year? I'm not saying that I won't shift the tax burden. I'm saying that I'm not going to tax people more who I'm not going to raise taxes on people who make less than $400,000 a year. As I said, I may shift the overall tax burden. I don't know exactly how I'm going to do that yet. I need to study that issue and I need to sit down with experts and figure out the best way for achieving, for keeping our economy moving and re actually rebooting our economy. And But also, ultimately, I think what you talked about at the beginning, which was to figure out ways to restore the middle class in this country and reduce these extreme dis disparities between very wealthy, the uh, very wealthy, these huge aggregations of wealth and the widespread poverty that we're seeing below. We need to do that. It's not healthy for our society. It is an unstable configuration that cannot support democracy for any kind of sustained period. One of the reasons I think you're completely right that critics of extreme wealth think that there are anti-democratic implications are because the very, very wealthy have tried to do things like buy their way into elections the way that uh, Bloomberg did in the last cycle. There's obviously an incredibly corruptive influence from lobbying money and politics, things that you've criticized a great deal in the context of the CDC and the pharmaceutical industry. And so I'm curious how you plan to run your own campaign. Do you have any plans to take a no, co no corporate money pledge the way that by, uh, Bernie Sanders did in 2020 and still managed to out fundraise the rest of the field? And if not, how do you plan to manage some of the conflicts of interest that emerge when people, let's say some of the Silicon Valley billionaires who have shown interest in your campaign, start to make demands potentially uh, that are out of step with what the American public would like? Uh, I am going to, I mean, our, you know, there's there, there are limits on what I can accept. You know, the the campaign can only accept contributions of three thousand three hundred dollars per per person. That's the maximum campaign contribution. Uh, most of our contributions so far have been much smaller than that. Uh, and you know, and I and we are not legally allowed to accept campaign contributions that are larger than that. Of course, there are these other ways that people contribute, right? They host fundraisers for folks. They're independent expenditures. They're not supposed to be directed by campaigns. But campaigns have found ways of getting around that. I'm not saying you specifically, obviously, but there are ways that campaigns signal how they would like money to be spent. And with Citizens United, there's almost an unlimited ability for corporations to spend uh, to support their own political causes. Is that a concern for you? Do you have any plans to address Citizens United? Do you have any plans to do campaign finance reform? 
I don't think there's anything that's probably more important for a democracy than figuring out a way to reverse Citizens United from a pragmatic standpoint, because the Supreme Court has upheld that and has, I think, very, very wrongly equated campaign contributions with free speech and essentially given them First Amendment protections. I think that was a very bad decision. I think it's been a catastrophe for our country. Uh, I am open to suggestions about how to reverse Citizens United. It's, it's something that I've been thinking about since 2000, I think 2008, when it was, uh, when that decision came down. You know, we almost lost democracy. We did lose democracy in the, this country and during the Gilded Age in the 1880s and 1890s. And uh, where you had our, our country senators at that point were not directly elected, they were chosen by the legislatures. The big trust, the steel trust, the oil trust, the railroad trust, the sugar trust own those legislatures. It was literally, literally said of the Pennsylvania state legislature that nobody was for sale because John D. Rockefeller already owned them all and he would not part with them. And that was the way it was for legislatures all over the country. And so those wealthy individuals were choosing the United States senators. They controlled the political parties. They chose the, the president. And um, we were able to rescue democracy. And in 1908, we passed a law. One of the things we did, we passed antitrust law laws, we passed child labor laws. We gave women the vote. Uh, but the, probably the most important law that we passed to restore democracy was a law that we passed in 2008 that made it illegal, or 1908, that made it illegal for large corporations to contribute to federal political campaigns. And that law stayed in place for 100 years and protected American democracy. The United States Supreme Court threw out that law in 2008 and unleashed the tsunami of corporate money. Now, you know, I'm going to tell you this. I'm not allowed to coordinate with our super PACs, um, but uh, it's, I think, you know, and Bernie was able to do, as you said, to raise a lot of money. And I think Obama was raised a lot of money. And that's what I'm going to focus on from small donors. Uh, but, you know, if you're a super PAC, I, you know, it, it, the law is just wrong in our country, but it's hard to, uh, you know, it, it, we're, we, you, at, at some point you have to say, okay, I'm going to play by the rules as they are given to us. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to bring a knife to a gunfight. Mm. And um, and uh, so I don't know what they're going to do, but I can see the logic of, of, uh, of taking money from larger donors if you're, you know, if you're supporting somebody that's going to try to reform the system. I want to ask you about the culture, uh, social issues. You are someone who's getting some support from, I think, Republicans or former Republicans, uh, maybe because of your stances on uh, vaccines, aspects of COVID. Um, conservative voters right now, a lot of them on the right are animated by culture war issues. These questions about gender identity in school, in sports, it's, it kind of goes under the category of wokeness. I wonder, because uh, I'm not sure I've heard you um, talk about this as much or answer questions about it. Do you, what are your views on wokeness? Do you have a definition of, of wokeness? Do you have views on uh, transgender individuals participating in sports, um, the, the, what's being taught in schools? You know, what is your view on this package of woke issues that so animates uh, the, the right, which are some of your supporters? I have said this in the past, I'm opposed to um, to uh, uh, transgender people, to, to people who were born as biological males, participating in competitive female sports. If, they, if sports, uh, and I'll tell you why, my uncle was the author of Title IX, and he spent years and years allied with, with women's groups who were being, uh, who were being treated like uh, redheaded stepchildren when it came to by colleges and everybody else when it came to sport to organize sports. My uncle fought for, wrote, and passed Title IX, and it finally gave women the ability to participate in sports. And it doesn't make any sense to me that somebody who is, has the advantages, the physical advantage of being born a, a, a biological male in muscle mass 
in height and size and strength and coordination should be able to walk off a playing field playing men's sports and and then walk onto a playing field playing women's sports. And that, I want to start by saying this, though. Anybody who makes that choice to be transgender gender, should not be shamed. They should not be embarrassed. They should be proud of, of their choices, and they should be respected. Those choices should be respected. We should all do that. But there's there's that that is a boundary that just doesn't make any sense for anybody to you know to me it just doesn't make any sense and you know I have a niece who is playing softball for Boston College right now and she has devoted tens of thousands of hours in her life practicing that sport with the hope of getting that scholarship and everybody on her team is in the same way and it doesn't seem to me fair. As somebody who has these profound biological advantages should be able to walk on that team and take one of those places from one of those girls. It just doesn't make any sense. And Mr. Kennedy, there, there's a recent study that shows that a lot of Americans are increasingly divided on that particular issue. But given the very small number of trans kids there actually are, or trans people, generally speaking, that are seeking participation in sports, some members of the trans community are frustrated that there hasn't been more attention to the literally hundreds of pieces of legislation that have been coming down the transom just since the beginning of this year that, that would do things like restrict people's ability to dress as the gender that wasn't assigned as birth in public. There have been drag performances, performances of classic Shakespeare plays that have been implicated in some of this legislation, legislation that uh, impedes on a parent's uh, and family's ability to make decisions about the health of their children in consultation with a doctor. And I wonder what you say to the Re Republican Party, who are largely pushing legislation, is, is, are pushing pieces of legislation like this down the pike. Uh, I would say what I said a moment ago is that I believe that people should be respected in their choices and that, you know, they should be supported in those choices and that, um, you know, about their their gender choices. So uh, I, I don't, you know, uh, any legislation that is mean spirited or that is going to, you know, that is disrespectful to people or is bullying, I don't, you know, I'm not going to be for that. Well, I want to ask you, uh, changing gears a little bit, about Donald Trump. Obviously, he was just indicted under the Espionage Act. Now, you have been very vocal about your support for Julian Assange, saying on day one uh, you would like to pardon him. He was also obviously charged under the Espionage Act. And many conservatives right now are looking to the fact that Mike Pence, uh, Joe Biden, Hillary Clinton have also had these document retention cases, uh, all of whom have not been prosecuted. We don't know yet what's going to happen in the Joe Biden case, of course. But they contrast that with how certain whistleblowers like Julian Assange, reality winner, et cetera, have been treated, even when they, too, had no— um, uh, there was no proof that they were attempting to do actual espionage, give the documents to a foreign poli uh, po uh, party. In one instance, a 66-year-old Vietnamese American civil servant was jailed for five and a half years for taking documents home just to work on them over the weekend to get ahead. So what do you say to conservatives who say what's happening to Trump is, in fact, a political prosecution if people who have, are similarly um, implicated in what he's been charged with or who have done less have gone to jail, but Hillary Clinton, Mike Pence, um, and uh, uh, Joe Biden himself are not being charged? Well, first of all, I don't like the Espionage Act, and I think it should be repealed. Um, I think, you know, I I thought the, the Brianna, I thought the New York prosecutor, I, I also want to say this, I don't know that much about I have not studied the case against Donald Trump. So, uh, you know, I'm speaking kind of off the top of my head. I looked at uh, a kind of casually or cursorily the case, the New York case um, that, uh, you know, that the New York prosecutor Eric Adams brought. And I thought that that case was weak. And I, I, if I had been a prosecutor, I was once a prosecutor, I would not have brought that case. And I think you can make a case for it, but um, I think when it comes to prosecuting a political figure, particularly a president of the United States, the prosecutors have to walk a really thin line and a very, very delicate line because we, our country has always tried to, to avoid the optics and the reality of politically based 
uh, politically grounded prosecutions. It's something that's done in totalitarian countries. It was something that was done in Great Britain uh, prior to the American Revolution and that the framers of our constitution were warned against. So people are being, they, they're two kind of countervailing for, um, idea, principles. One is that people who are in political power should not be above the law. If they break the law, they should pay for it like other people. But there's another countervailing uh, principle, which is in democracies, it's dangerous to start prosecuting people criminally uh, and unless there is a really compelling reason to do so because it, it, it gives rise to accusation in the optics that it's a politically based prosecution. So I think prosecutors have to be careful about that. I thought the New York... Um, prosecution did not, in my view, and again, you know, the prosecutor may know more about it than I do, so I don't want to second guess him, but in my view, it didn't pass the threshold that you, you know, that I would want to see for a prosecution of the, of the president of the United States. Um, the, I don't know enough about this case. I mean, I've heard things about it. I think that the danger to President Trump of this case is that the judge made this extraordinary decision to penetrate the attorney-client privilege, which is almost never done, but it is done in cases where the attorneys uh, appear to be in collusion to commit a crime. Right. And that is, you know, and that is, um, you know, I guess was the rationale in this case. And I think once that decision was made, that the case against President Trump is very, very strong. Yeah, just if you ask me um, whether I like the Espionage Act, I think the Espionage Act has been an anti-democratic act from its inception. It has always been in disrepute, particularly among liberals. Liberals have always hated that act, and it has been used to silence people who should have had the right to free speech throughout American history. It has been misused and abused by people in political power throughout our history. And, you know, if it was my choice, I would repeal it. Well, just quickly on that, Tucker Carlson, in the latest episode of his new Twitter program, made the argument that the reason that Trump is being prosecuted under the Espionage Act, while others haven't been, is because of the statements that he made in the context of his 2016 campaign and after that were targeting the blob and the fact that he's positioned himself whether authentically or just rhetorically, as an anti-war candidate. You have spoken about the consequences of doing so, again, talking about the fact that you think that uh, your uncle was killed in part because of his anti-war stance. And I wonder what you make of this argument. Do you think that uh, Trump's politics and his dissonance with the intelligence community and the military-industrial complex are part of what's fueling the prosecution of him under the Espionage Act? I would have no idea about that. I mean, how would I know that? I, I mean, nothing those guys do, you, you can't see, it's all obscure. So I would have no way of knowing, or I, I would never speculate about something about which I just, I have no way of knowing what motivated the, you know, the, this prosecution. I mean, listen, I don't look, I ne never, I try never to look at people's motives because you, know, you never can understand them. I wrote this whole book on Anthony Fauci and Bill Gates. And never in that book do I look into their heads and say, this is why they were doing that action. All I can say is this is the actions they took. These actions appear wrong on their face, but I can't really speculate as to why they took them. And I'm not going to speculate about this. Hmm. The DNC uh, has stated it won't actually hold a Democratic primary debate. I wonder what you make of how you know, you're being treated by the DNC, given your your fairly significant minority, but significant poll numbers. And if, for instance, we held a debate here at Rising at the Hill with you, Marianne Williamson, and we would, of course, invite President Biden, would you participate in that? Well, I would love to participate in a debate if President Biden participates in a debate. I think it's wrong, you know, I think it's wrong that he's not gonna participate. And the reason I think it's wrong, of course he has that power to not do it. And it's a strategic choice for him. And I think if I were in his shoes, I wouldn't want to debate um, either. But I think it's bad for America at this point. I think if if he doesn't feel that he can debate, it's not it's not good because, you know, there's so many people in this country who feel that the system is rigged. 
and that particularly the political system and the electoral system is rigged and that are, you know, it's the political parties like the Soviet Union that are picking the candidates and the public has nothing to do with them. And I think it's really important for both political parties to make themselves at this point role models, templates for democracy, not only for this country, but, you know, to show around the world that we actually have a real democracy where politicians are out doing retail politics, going to town halls that are not just, you know, fixed where, they, where you know what the questions are going to be, you know who the people are, they're screened, but are actually going into barbershops and nail salons and diners and gas stations and talking to the public. If there's a, a huge number of people in this country who feel that they've been forgotten. You know, 57% of Americans who couldn't put their hands on $1,000 if they have an emergency right now, and they feel like there's nobody in the political system that's listening to them. And they're right. They're, the, the political the politicians now, they, because of Citizens United, they're, they're, they, it's very easy for a politician to go to the billionaires, raise a billion dollars, and then fly over the country at 30,000 feet and aerial bombard the country with advertisements, and then drop in occasionally for these phony rallies that are just kabuki theater where they know everybody who went into that rally. They know the questions they're going to ask. And, and, you know, there's a lot of flag waving and, and clap, clapping. It's not politics. It's fake politics. And I think it's really, and people know that. Americans feel that they're not being listened to, that the system is broken. Even on, you know, January 6th, as bad as that was, you have to understand that they're, it, it was motivated by people who think the system is rigged. And one of our responses to that, other than prosecuting the people who broke the law, should also be, okay, it's time to fix the system. Let's not, let's not, you know, let's not, let's not allow people to continue to believe that the whole thing is rigged against them and that, you know, everything is fixed and that the political parties get to choose who's going to run and anybody who tries to enter the process is fenced out. So I don't think that's healthy. Well, you made it just quickly. You, you made a really excellent point about how few Americans can access cash right now. Uh, the stat we used to say during the Bernie campaign was that 40 percent of Americans can come up with four hundred dollars for an emergency. Right now, in the fall, Biden made a, a, a deal with Republicans to end the student loan moratorium that Trump implemented during uh, the pandemic. Uh, and so People are going to be asked to pay a lot more uh, than a few hundred dollars, uh, four, five hundred, a thousand dollars, two thousand dollars, when their student loan payments kick in uh, again in the fall. Do you see any daylight between how you would handle the student debt crisis and what Joe Biden had, had done? And what do you make of the choice to end the student loan moratorium? I mean, I think we've got to we, we've got to give. Uh, uh, some kind of massive debt forgiveness in this generation of kids if we want to unleash their creative energies and rebuild our country. You know, it costs now, I paid, when I went to the University of Virginia Law School, I paid $600 per semester. And, uh, you know, and that was, that's low, but, but um, on average, the cost of education since 1970 has multiplied seven times and mm -hmm. they, you know my wife uh, it took her till she was who's a you know well-known actress and uh, it took her till she was 37 years old to pay back her student loan and that's Relatable. like an anchor <laughs> you know, it, just, it, it uh it's an anchor on on creative activity and entrepreneurial activity and the kind of you know uh, um and, and the kind of energies that we want to release in our our children. So to oh, that, to that point specifically, Mr. Kennedy, the, the, when you're talking about barriers on creativity and entrepreneurship, et cetera, health care is repeatedly raised by people, small business owners, et cetera, as one of the largest costs they have when they start a new business. And of course, Medicare for All was such an animating force of the last two Bernie campaigns and really galvanized a lot of previous non-voters uh, and disgruntled Democrats 
into a movement. You said in a recent interview that you were for Medicare for all in theory, but that you found it, um, I believe you were something along the lines of uh, politically uh, unlikely, Some, something to that effect. I don't mean to put words in your mouth. But it strikes me that some of the other things that you've been fighting for, I think really valiantly, like cutting the military budget, taking on the military industrial complex, are also things which will face intense pushback um, from the blob, from these deeply entrenched, very well-funded industries. Um, and, and that being said, given the obstacles to fighting the military industrial complex, what do you say to progressives who are disappointed that you don't seem to have that same uh, urgency with respect to health care, which is repeatedly ranked as such a significant concern for Americans, and Medicare for all in particular, which 88 percent of Democratic voters support? Yeah, well, let me answer both, uh, all of your questions. You know, one is just from a practical standpoint, Brianna, the, the, uh, in terms of cutting the military budget, um, it's easier for a president to do than passing a national health care program. And, and a lot of those costs that, you know, the president can do on his own without that much cooperation from Congress. Um, so... Uh, it, it, and that's why I think it's like, it's a of course you're you're challenging vested interests that are as powerful as the pharmaceutical industry and the you know the medical cartels, but it's an easier thing. The the president does not need to get you know uh, 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 fifty one senators and uh, two hundred and fifty congressmen on board. Um, so. And then, you know, with Medicare, look, I watched my uncle and fought with him for 50 years trying to get national health care through. And so, and I, you know, I'm very conscious of, kind of the deadlock that he reached. And I am, you know, if, if it were up to me, I would say we should have Medicare for all, all right now. The, the current way of, fund, of funding Medicare is not worth of funding health care in our country is dysfunctional. Um, I what I would advocate is a for is a public option option which goes which will lead ultimately into Medicare for all if it but but give people individual choice. I'm somebody who is for personal freedom for personal choice, and I think the public option is more consistent with that belief. And if we can make a public option, a public option that, for example. I would charge a maximum of 8% of, of people's income rather than the 20% that they're paying today. If we can make that option work and if we can make it attractive to Americans, you will naturally evolve it into Medicare for all. But you will do it through a process of choice and evolution rather than, uh, than imposing it on people with a lot of hostility, which is just practically impossible to do as you probably understand and I understand because I was involved in the healthcare battle for, for so so long. Well can you can speak specifically problem. to no, what you I, think, I the, think the, the yeah I sorry think we need to think of it. I think we think need to think because we have to acknowledge these deadlocks, acknowledge these practical obstacles, and we have to think in terms of ways to unify Americans in in ways that will reduce the overall cost of health care. The healthcare costs now in this country are 4.3 trillion. That, that is far higher per capita than any other country on earth. We pay much more than anybody, double or triple what people pay per capita in Europe or Canada. And our healthcare outcomes are 79th in the world. We're behind Mongolia, we're behind Cuba, we're behind Costa Rica and healthcare outcomes. And one of the problems, one of the reasons for that, probably the principal reason, in fact, the principal reason is, is chronic disease epidemic. We have the highest burden of chronic disease of any nation in the world. Why is that? Why can't we eliminate it? We know that it comes from environmental exposures. Why aren't we doing the science to identify what those exposures are and to eliminate them? That will eliminate a, a huge chunk of our healthcare costs and give us a lot more elasticity and flexibility in the way that we allocate those costs to, you know, to uh, different actors within the system, which is really what you're doing when you switch from HMOs to, you know, to Medicare for all. Mm -hmm.
Mm. Yeah, Mr. Kennedy, I do think, I do just want to push back and say that I think, for one, the continued presence of a private health care system undermines some of the savings that come through a Medicare for all style system by letting people opt out in a way that diminishes the pool that the costs are spread over. So that's that's one concern people have with that. But more specifically, you're, you're such a vocal and persuasive critic of industry capture and the ways uh, and the and the kinds of corruption that caused there to be such a disconnect between that what the average American wants, 88 percent of Democrats and a majority, a slim majority, but a majority of Republicans all support Medicare for all. So when you look at Congress and say, well, Congress won't pass it, even though the constituents in those congressional di districts want it, I, I think that what people are looking for is a, a leader, a president who exposes the extent to which elected representatives are not, in fact, representing the interests of their people, and that they feel pressure, therefore, to start to do that. And when they hear a, future, a presidential candidate saying, well, you know, there are these obstacles, and so we're going to take another track, it makes some people ask, well, when are we ever going to get that Medicare for all? When are we, how many, yes, we have chronic disease, we have these other issues, but how long are people supposed to subsist and suffer and have medical debt and die? while we know overwhelming majorities of Americans all want one solution, and it is elected representatives, including many of those in the Democratic Party, that are standing in the way. You know, Brianna, I agree with virtually everything that you say. Um, the, the, you know, the issue is that I've been, you know, I've been in the, in the trenches for 50 years fighting on this issue, and it's an issue that is because of the, you know, because of what we're dealing with in Congress and elsewhere, it's, 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 it's entrenched, it's a source of polarization, and I just, I feel like I need to uh, look at ways of solving this that are actually practical. So I would like to get to the same place you are, which is Medicare for all, but I, you know, I think the, the, the path to doing that and, and if you remember, Brianna, when Obamacare got passed, there was a uh, there, there were a lot of problems with it. There were a lot of glitches with it and that made people very, very angry about it for the first two or three years. And then those glitches were slowly worked out. And the option that I'm proposing, which is to begin with the public option, will allow the glitches to be worked out in advance so that ultimately when and if we get to Medicare for all, we won't have those uh, those times where people really get harmed by by the implementation of a new system. Mm. So, you know, that's, I, I would say that's my best answer to you. I want mm. the same thing that you want. I believe most Americans that want, want it. I think, you know, listen, my, my uncle, you know, I, I, I can't tell you the number of times that I was um, in Senate caucus meetings with him in his office talking to people campaigning across the country, pointing out that this was the only country in the world, where the only industrialized country in the world where people can work their entire lives and have their savings wiped out by a single illness, catastrophic illness. This is the only country in the world, industrialized country, where parents can sit in a living room and listen to their baby crying in the room next door and have to wonder whether that baby is $50 sick or $100 sick, $500 sick before they bring him to a hospital and then have to make really difficult choices. And it's unfair. It's wrong. We should have, we should have Medicare for all in this country. The, the you know, the obstacle that I just recognize is somebody who is trying to deal with issues pr pr pragmatically is that it is, uh, you know, it, it's a, it's a, to put it mildly, a heavy lift. Hmm. Want to be respectful of your time, of course, so this will be the last question, but just before you go, on the show we've been discussing increased interest in aliens, UFOs. Congress recently uh, held historic hearings on Capitol Hill on the matter. Uh, whistleblower David Grush has claimed that these hearings fell short of sharing all the government knows with the American people, uh, going so far as to claim the government is in possession of actually non-human craft. So we'd love to know your thoughts on this. If you think there's UFO intelligence that should be declassified, um, you know, rather than having this guarded closely, whatever it is, by military and U.S. intelligence agencies? 
All I can say is if they got it, it's one of the first questions I'm going to ask, and I'm going to want to see the little fellas and their and their spacecraft, and I will, uh, and then disclose everything that I can. I'll disclose everything to the American public unless there's some really compelling reason uh, not to, which I, you know, I don't, I, I don't anticipate. But I, I mean, I'm, I, I read the article. By that guy, you know, about that whistleblower who's still in the military, and it just seemed very credible to me, but I don't know. I don't have any way of assessing it, and I guess they're taking it seriously on Capitol Hill, which I'm I'm very happy about. I mean, I, I think everybody's curious about this. Everybody would love to know whether we're, we have, you know, whether we have company neighbors in the universe. It's really exciting, and I think, uh, I mean, I would, you know, I would, that's the kind of thing I think we, we should share with the American people and have discussions, philosophical discussions about what that means for us and, you know, what that means for our planet and, you know, how that, and, and, and particularly whether it's a good thing for us to continue to, you know, spend so much money fighting each other when maybe we should be trying to make this planet livable mm. and have habitable and you know do all the other things i think it will be really good for us to know those things i, I suppose they want to keep it secret so they can you know weaponize those technologies or whatever they're i guess they you know they probably think they have good reasons for doing it but i think there's compelling reasons if they have that stuff that we should release it to people are you a sci-fi guy at all mr kennedy am i what are you a sci-fi guy do you have a kind of a broader interest in in entertainment that's related to this kind of stuff I would say that I always like science fiction. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, you know, I'm curious about aliens. I've never seen an alien. I have. Can we get it confirmed that RFK Jr. is a, is a Trekkie, is a Star Wars fan? <laughs> Rihanna like loves, loves Star Trek. <laughs> I like Star no, Wars, I'm gonna tell you Battle something. Star Galactica. My, my, wife, my wife had a show uh, called Son of Zorn which was a where she was married to this alien. And so she went to the Comic-Con conferences where, you know, there uh, all the Trekkies are. And, and she was a sh for a short time, a big hero in those conferences. And I, a couple of times said, I want to go with you and, you know, and see all these <laughs> things. So I'm, I'm, I'm not completely immune to it, but I, I'm still <laughs> the jury's out. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., uh, we hope to have you back here on Rising, perhaps in a debate format. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for having me. Joe Rogan is being accused of promoting misinformation once again. This time, virologist Peter Hotez tore into Rogan on Twitter for hosting Robert F. Kennedy Jr. on his podcast last week, where they talked about COVID, controversial treatments, and call the vaccine into question. Rogan responded in kind Saturday, challenging Hotez to debate RFK Jr., tweeting, quote, Peter, if you claim what RFK Jr. is saying is misinformation, I am offering you $100,000 to the charity of your choice if you're willing to debate him on my show with no time limit. On Sunday night, Hotez appeared to be open to returning to Rogan's show. Here he is on MSNBC's Mehdi Hassan show Sunday night. Let's watch anti-vaccine disinformation it's always done a lot of damage and harm but now it's a yeah. lethal force in the united states and that's why we that's why we have to have that discussion and i offered to come and talk to go on joe rogan again i've been on a couple of times yeah. and have that discussion with him but not to turn it into the jerry springer show with having rfk jr <laughs> on Right, so he said he would come on again, but not debate RFK Jr. or someone of his ilk. Independent journalist Alex Rosen questioned Hotez over the weekend, confronting him about a potential matchup with the 2024 presidential candidate. Here's a little bit of that. So why are you not like going to debate uh, RFK on Joe Rogan's podcast? Oh come on, that's harassing. I'm just, I'm just curious. What? I no, no, nothing I, hostile. Just curious. I haven't said anything one way or the other. I mean, are you planning on doing it? Uh, you know, I just, he just invited me, so we'll see. And I think you should, though. Uh, well, we'll give it some, we'll give it some thought. Okay. Okay. And what do you have to say to people who think they're vaccine injured? Uh, come on. Anything for them? I don't come to my house. I mean, do you have anything to say to people that think, do you have anything to say to people? Yeah. I mean, do you think vaccine injuries are real, Peter? Peter, it's just a question. 
So that last clip is being characterized along with some of the Twitter pile on that's happened now that Elon Musk and some of these big ticket figures have gotten into the mix as harassment. It's seen as undue focus on this scientist um, that is coercive and perhaps even dangerous. Now, here's the thing. Everybody's weighing into this question of whether or not people can debate. And in the, in the course of it, people are seeing some kind of wild stuff from my perspective. Like, science isn't about debate. And you can hear uh, Dr. Hotez saying this on Mehdi Hassan's show last night. Well, I think science, the debate in science is framed in the context of peer-reviewed journals. That's fair enough. And, and Hotez kind of acknowledges that on Mehdi Hassan's show and elsewhere. But it does seem odd at a certain point for there to be all of these claims about how easily debunked certain kinds of information are where no one who has decades of expertise in doing so is willing to step up to the plate and simply do it. And what that does, I, I appreciate the, the counter argument that people are putting out there is, well, someone like Joe Rogan or RFK Jr., they have a different kind of skill other than scientific expertise. They are debaters. They are politicians. They are wordsmiths. And it's not fair to ask a scientist to be good, not at science, but at this other skill where if you fail, you could look like you're losing, even if substantively on the merits, you're right. And so I, I take that. I, I take that criticism. I take that argument. But are you saying that there's not a scientist in America, there's not a virologist in America who is equipped also rhetorically, linguistically to make their case? And are we also saying that there, it isn't so clear that what Rogan is saying is scientifically and what RFK Jr. is saying is so scientifically baseless that it's impossible just to say, okay, what studies are you looking at? Here is why you're misinterpreting them, or here is why they represent a very small minority of studies that exist in the world, and get some clarification. Because at this point, I think that there's a lot of onus on journalists to now become scientists and debaters in order to get into the fray that has been abandoned by so many scientists with expertise that I'm interested to hear about. Sure, uh, absolutely. So to the last clip, um Look, is it harassing? No, it looked like he was confronting him in a, a, a public area before he goes into his property. So no, but you know I don't really love the tactic of chasing down people to their homes and confronting them this way. Obviously, sometimes that's something you have to do, but doesn't, it didn't seem called for here. If that was all we were talking about, I'd say, yeah, that's not a friendly, neighborly tactic. Um, but uh, uh, to your broader question, you're absolutely right. And if he's not the guy to do the debate, then maybe he can recommend someone sure. who is, because it's clearly an important debate to have. He has time to go on, and, and like he has time to go on friendly Mehdi Hassan show and complain about how how this is the whole. This is not science. Like science is sac sacrosanct. The way they're talking about it, it sounds like religion rather than science. No, it's it's not the the priesthood, the higher people, they decide on truth, and then it's not your right to question or scrutinize that. Um, even if, and e so I don't accept that framing, and then even if science, even if that framing was correct for science, then the policy implications yes. are totally different. It could yes. be, well, we're all decided on what the science says, but then where the, it should be required and what the trade-off should be, and then, and, and, and then the, the science of public opinion and how you influence people to make the good decision in keeping with science is totally something different that they have no expertise in. But I don't actually even feel that way about underlying science. It should be open for debate. There's, when you look at these things closely, you find out that there's a whole lot of studies that often reach different conclusions conclusions, and then when you look at them really closely, which you're right, takes a different set of skills sometimes than raw, you know, crossfire style, you know, in the arena For debating. Sure. Yeah. Um, there, there's, a, there's a lot of noise and a lot of confusion, a lot of, well, this doesn't quite measure that because here's what they did. A lot in the in the in the social studies and like social psychology studies are retracted constantly because when they duplicate the results they can't right. get them right. because there's a lot of creative you know j jumping around um, and, and then further I would say maybe you, maybe he doesn't like Rogan or doesn't trust Rogan because Rogan is is clearly very sympathetic much more sympathetic to RFK Jr.'s views but a three hour podcast is a better venue frankly yeah. for hammering out um, these kinds of, of differences than. 
really almost any other venue because there's not enough time. Like, yeah. we could host a debate on our show, but even if, you know, we stretch it, let it go for 20 minutes, well, it's still 20 <laughs> minutes. Yeah. And we're interjecting, and it's like, I, it, it can't be, especially for very complicated questions, I don't think it's a good format. And, and we still do better than almost anywhere else in cable news where it's like, three minutes for a segment. And to be fair to Dr. Hotez, he says he will, he has been on Rogan, I believe, twice before, and he says he's willing to go mm -hmm. back. And there is an argument that Joe Rogan definitely could cue up Rogan, uh, sorry, uh, RFK Jr. statements and have him respond piece by piece to what he has already said sure. on the show and basically get to the same result without RFK Jr. being in the room. I'm not like so committed to the necessity of RFK Jr. being mm. in the room, although, although I do think it could be instructive and helpful. RFK Jr. is not someone who is overly aggressive in debates or who wouldn't, I think, allow Dr. Hotez to talk. I don't think he has concern about getting talked over or anything like that. But part of my frustration as a layperson observing this is so much of this discourse is now taken up by, is it right to believe this? Is it right to say this? Is it right to debate this? Where we could just be spending time talking about the substance of what people are saying. Something that I am now having to do in a way that's very frustrating. And to your point earlier, I. There have for there has been a, for a very long time. I, when I was a history of science major, I thought I was going to be a science journalist. I interned at Science Magazine one summer in college. Like I, there there are significant problems with scientists who write papers that have a whole variety of results and conclusions that the media, the AP, will print up. Uh, new research shows cholesterol is deadly. Don't eat eggs. And then we, three years later, oh, actually, they were measuring the wrong kind of cholesterol, and it turns out that eggs are really good for you, and people who eat you know, two eggs a day outlive everybody else. How many times have we seen the back and forth with eggs and coffee and glasses of wine and bars of uh, uh, non-milk chocolate? Mm -hmm. And it's not that the science necessarily was always wrong. Sometimes the science was wrong. Sometimes the conclusions of the study were interpreted overly broadly. But sometimes it'll be the same study that's interpreted in different ways. So one of the things that's in contention right now with RFK Jr. is that there is a study about, there's, a, there's an argument about two kinds of mercury, the kind of environmental mercury and the kind of mercury that is now taken out of most, I think all childhood vaccines, but is still in a flu vaccine that is sometimes administered to pregnant women. Now, there's a study that that vaccine only when administered during the first semester during pregnant women hasn't had some, some correlation to uh, bad health outcomes, principally uh, higher rates of autism. Now, that's a very limited finding. So you could look at that study and say it shows that from the risk for pregnant women of taking a flu vaccine is nil. Or you could look at that study and say there needs to be more research about what happens mm -hmm. when you administer it in the first semester, tri trimester. I think it would be wrong to say um, pregnant women shouldn't take vaccines because there's also a lot of risk associated with getting flu as a pregnant woman, right? You've got to take that into account. You've got to weigh the, weigh the risk rewards. But it might be reasonable to say, pregnant women, just wait to the second trimester before you get your flu, flu vaccine. There's another study about um, whether the, the mercury, the good mercury versus the bad mercury is processed by the body differently. And there's a study that says, oh, no, it's actually the case that the kind of mercury in vaccines gets eliminated, cleared from the body more quickly than the mercury you have in fish. So you shouldn't be as concerned as you are about the mercury that you get from fish. However, there is a study that not just measures how much mercury is in your blood, but because they did it on monkeys and not humans, could kill the monkeys and actually measure how much mercury had collected in the brain. And in that case, that gives you a very different right. picture of results. So I need scientists grappling with this stuff so old little me doesn't have to be saying, well, one group of people is saying the study claims one thing. One group of people is saying the study is claiming another thing. I think on some big, broad issues like there has been no causal relationship established between vaccines and autism. Yes, that is absolutely true. And I think people are right to criticize RFK Jr. for sometimes suggesting otherwise. But having pat conclusive statements like you just have to trust the science, especially after there's been so much back and forth around COVID vaccines and what they can and cannot do, it's just going to strike people like you're trying to hide and cover up the truth. And I think it's going to grow people's skepticism in a way that could lead to bad outcomes like low vaccine, um, uh, fear and for people right. taking vaccines who uh, are children and you get measles outbreaks and things like that. That can kill a lot of people. They're at the level of this question has been decided for you, yeah. so it's not open for debate. We have th – this is not something you can have a different opinion on. We've settled it. Don't ask any questions, which is a very um, – outdated, I think, way of seeing, you know, it used to be 
media, government in less polarized time, in, in times where there were honestly fewer alternative media out platforms to compete for people to just spout off and say what they think, maybe you could manufacture this idea that this is a settled question. That's just that's not something you can do anymore. Yeah. I think it's it can be beneficial. It can be harmful, but it can also be beneficial for society that that's not something you can do anymore. They're operating in this, uh, and by they I mean Dr. Hotez, Mehdi Hassan type people operating in this world where they can just say, nope, the we're not debating yeah. it because there's no debate. Joe Rogan is the most popular media platform in America. Sure. If you choose not to engage with what he's saying, it, there's no platform or deplatforming. There's no, well, the conversation will go away. People are saying things like, well, I wouldn't debate a flat earther. It's like, well, sure. But if the flat earth movement got to a point where 11 million people or whatever it is that mm -hmm. tune into Joe Rogan every week are being convinced by a so-called expert that flat eartherism is true, it might be worthwhile if you are an astronaut that's been to space and looked out of the big blue ball <laughs> just to show up and say, hey, guys, remember gravity? Remember how the horizon line curves? Remember how I was in space? What, right. What's the harm of I, I don't know. I'm really struggling with the idea that allowing some of the toxic stuff to fester unchecked is really going to have the effect of dampening it in any way. Right. You, you, and it used to be a little bit easier to, well, if we don't talk about it, it's not being talked about because yeah. there wasn't a platform to talk Absolutely. about it. Absolutely. They can't do that anymore. Yeah. Yeah. More rising right after this. All right, guys, very excited to welcome back to the program RFK Jr. He, of course, is presidential candidate, activist, and author. Great to see you, sir. Good to see you, sir. Thanks for having me back. It's, it's, uh, it's wonderful to be back with you. Yeah, it's truly, it's truly our pleasure. Um, wanted to get off the top your reaction to breaking news. Of course, we have new charges filed against former President Trump with regards to his handling of classified documents and uh, alleged obstruction. Just wanted to get your reaction to those indictments. You know, I don't know enough about them. I, I mean, I, I would say this, and, I, you know, I'm not giving you anything special, any kind of special inside information or insight. I thought the New York case was a very weak case, and if I had been a prosecutor, I would not have brought it, um, mainly because it's the president of the United States. And so you, you, you have to kind of tiptoe through the minefields if you're a prosecutor um, because... Uh, you want to avoid the optics that this is a political prosecution in the United States. Uh, we've always tried to avoid those optics. Um, but this case looks much stronger. Mm -hmm. it, and the reason it, to me it, it's surprising is because the judge penetrated the attorney client privilege, which almost never happens. And, you know, normally the conversations between, between an attorney and a client are privileged and no court can look at those. But in this case, the, the exception is if the attorney and the client are plotting a crime together or involved in sort of some kind of criminal conspiracy, then the courts will allow that to be penetrated. And one, once the determination is made and that threshold is passed, where the court says, okay, you can now look at conversations between the client and his attorney. It is, uh, it is really, really, um, it's, it'll be mayhem for the client because a client was, uh, was having those conversations, assuming nobody would ever see them and that he could, uh, he could say anything he wanted. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I think that that, you know, that, um, uh, that makes this case look very real and I think very dangerous for President Trump. Sir, would you ever consider a pardon for President Trump? I, I wouldn't even talk about that at this point. Got it. Gotcha. Um, we wanted to ask you, too, uh, a little bit about your views of current President Biden. So one of the concerns among the general public and among Democratic primary voters as well is about his age and his just ability to perform the uh, the job that is entailed as president of the United States. You, do you personally think that Joe Biden is fit to serve as president for another four years? Uh, you know, I don't I don't have any idea. I think people around him um, should be giving them good advice on that if they think that there's 
a lack of mental acuity or lack of uh, capacity to, to deal with crises or lack of independent, you know, a, a, an ability to exercise independent and, uh, and very good judgment. I think that they and have his family and his counselors have a have an obligation to, to our country to you know to tell them to sit, step down. But I don't have any kind of insight. And you know, I see some of the films and stuff. Um, right, and you know him, don't you? Yeah, but I haven't seen him in years. And when I you know when I had interactions with him, he was always very sharp. And uh, so I don't know what he's like now behind the scenes. I mean, all we we see him in these kind of bubbles, and um, and so I, I I I have no idea how to assess that. Yeah, well, that's why it'd be good to have debates so that the American yes. people could assess for themselves. I agree, uh, sir. One of the interesting things in primary differences between yourself and President Biden that you've been talking about is the way that you would approach the war in Ukraine. So I'm curious, right now, we see recent polling uh, have in front of me about 79% of Democrats say, according to Axios Ipso, say that they support continuing military aid to Ukraine. Since you are a Democratic candidate, how do you plan on changing some of people's minds within the Democratic base about the U.S. approach to Ukraine? I mean, I my only way of doing that is to continue talking about it. and continuing to sort of get people to, uh, you know, I don't think you even have to change people's minds about, uh, about the, you know, about whether, I mean, you know, clearly Putin was, is, you know, uh, broke the law. He's a gangster. The, you know, this was a brutal invasion that could have been avoided. Um, so, and I don't think you need to change people's minds about that. I think we, we all want peace. And, uh, you know, the, the the number of Ukrainians who have now died, some estimates are over 350,000 of the kids, Ukrainian kids on the front lines, and then 14 or 15,000 civilians. And that's not good for anybody. And then 100,000, 30 to 80,000 Russians. And, you know, nobody, that, it's just not good for anybody. We should, we should be looking for paths to peace. And I think most America, if you frame the, the, the polling question, should we be looking for paths to peace? I think most people will agree that we should be, that this is not good for anybody. And it's definitely not good from a geopolitical strategy for us because it's, you know, we said, well, we're going to bankrupt Russia, but we're really destroying the economy in Europe and pushing Russia into the embrace uh, with China, which is the worst geopolitical outcome that we could possibly have. So I don't think this is good for us. It's not good for America, certainly. And, and the cost of the war is enormous, $113 billion so far. The, you know, the entire budget of EPA is $12 billion a year. The budget for CDC is $12 billion. Uh, we have We have 57% of Americans who cannot put their hands on $1,000 if they have an emergency. We've just cut food stamps, the SNAP program, to 30 million Americans by 90%. Oh, you know, I have a friend who uh, is a commercial fisherman, worked his whole life building his business, but he doesn't have benefits. And he's now on disability and he's been surviving on $280 with the food stamps a month. He got a call on March 1st that that was cut to uh, to $25 a month Jeez. and try to feed yourself on 90 cents a day. And meanwhile, because of the we're paying for all these wars and $16 trillion for the lockdowns, we have spiraling inflation, which has driven the cost of primary food stops 76% in two years. So he's dealing with, you know, the, this rising cost of food. And his food stamps getting cut to $25. That same month, we topped off Ukrainian aid at $113 billion. And we printed $300 billion more for the Silicon Valley to bail out the Silicon Valley banks. And so we got lots of the rich and for the war machine. And yet Americans are really in a, in a place of terrible, terrible hardship. If we took that money that we're giving to the Ukraine, we could pay for all of the food stamps for every American without any cuts at all. 
And so those are the choices we're making are, you know, we're going to starve people in our country. And in order to do something that I think we, we also need to look behind the sort of comic book depictions of this war, that it's a black and white war, which is the same kind of comic book depictions that they give us to justify every war. And we need to look at the U.S. role and the, the series of U.S. provocations that, um, that w without which this war would probably never have happened. I want to ask you a little bit more. Well, that doesn't excuse Vladimir Putin. It doesn't excuse, exclude Vladimir Putin, but uh, we, the neocons in the White House, bear a lot of responsibility for this conflict. Yeah. I wanted to ask you a little bit more about, okay, so if you're president, you're going to cut back the military aid, you're going to seek a diplomatic solution in Ukraine. What would you do to bolster the economic prospects of the American people? For example, do you support things like a federal jobs guarantee? Do you support a universal basic income? What would your economic platform be to help working class Americans? I mean, my my primary platform is to cut the costs on the military, you know, to, to get what we were told was a peace dividend after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the end of the Cold War in 1992. We were going to cut our military budget from about 600 billion a year to 200 billion a year, and that instead of making you know a, a billion dollar bo stealth bomber that can't fly in the rain, we were going to take that money and invest it in schools and in uh, infrastructure and in rebuilding America. And instead, you know, we've had the military industrial complex running our foreign policy and the neocons. And instead of going down to 200 billion, we're now at 1.3 trillion. If you look at all the costs associated with the military, and we need to cut that back to the, the, the levels that we were promised somewhere around those levels. Of course, we need to protect our country, uh, but we can do that by building Fortress America, army, arming ourselves to the teeth at home. And then, uh, and then spending that money to rebuild the industrial base in this country and rebuild the middle class. I mean, my job is going to, to rebuild the American middle class. We had a period in this country that I was lucky enough to grow up at the height of, beginning at the end of World War II to about 1980. That's called economists call the great great prosperity. It was the, the you know the, the the largest economic growth in the history of the world. We had the biggest and most robust middle class. We had we the, the middle class was an economic engine that generated half the wealth on the face of the earth from the American middle class. And people wanted our products. Uh, people you know loved our country. By the way. We were, we were really worshipped around the globe and looked to for moral authority and leadership. And, uh, you know, and I would like to get back to, to that kind of America where yeah. we focus on building our economy at home rather than uh, wars abroad. And does that, just to, to clarify, do you support either a federal jobs guarantee or a universal basic income as part of that program? I, I don't know about that. I need to look at those things, you know, and see, and I need to talk to a lot of economists and talk about the ups and downs of those issues. I, you know, I can see a lot of problems with those issues, which I think are obvious to anybody. Um, and it's a real departure from American free market capitalism. I'd like to try to give this system a chance to work. What do you think the minimum wage should be, sir? And let me say something about sure. that. I, um, you know, the reason I wouldn't just say an outright no to the universal um, basic income and a guaranteed jobs program is because I don't really understand what AI is going to do to our country and mm. what, you know, what self-driving, I mean, you know, even with self-driving cars, and I talked to this, to Elon Musk about this a couple of weeks ago. I read an article, and I don't know if this is true or not, that over 40% of American jobs include driving. So if you cut away all the driving cars, which is what the intention and aspiration of this, you know, of this new technology is, uh, I do not know what that's going to do to the American economy. I mean, we've had big dislocations before, you know, the end of the of slavery, for example, in our country. Right. 
And we had to do these big uh, economic readjustments. And then the invention of the automobile, you know, around at the beginning of the 1900s, when you had, a, you know, a, if you were a bug, buggy whip manufacturer, that job disappeared, right? Or if you were, a, you know, a buggy manufacturer, whatever, sure. a, a stable, those jobs disappeared in a couple of years. Uh, but they were replaced by new jobs. And in most cases, they were better jobs. They were manufacturing jobs in factories. They were in, uh, those were very high paying. And that's what supported the growth of the American middle class. Oh, I do not know. And, you know, I'm talking to people right now about this. I had a long talk with Jack Dorsey this morning, and I'm talking with a lot of people in the in the tech sector about how we're going to prepare ourselves for AI, for the AI economy when, you know, a lot of human jobs, even the writers in Hollywood, you know, one of the reasons for this strike now is that, you know, they, they have chat G GBT, right. which which can write a script for you in, in seconds. And, you know, a lot of people, even, you know, high level white collar jobs may be on the chopping block and may disappear. And we may have, we may face massive, massive unemployment over the next few years. And I think we really need the best minds in the world to come together and figure out how to protect ourselves against this. And so that's why I wouldn't instantaneously rule out you know, some kind of universal income or guaranteed jobs, which normally I would be, uh, uh, I would have a lot of antipathy for that because I'm a like a free market capitalism guy. Uh, but um, so I don't, you know, so that's why I'm hedging on that. Gotcha. Sure. Uh, just to return to the minimum wage question, assuming, you know, nothing does change. Do you have a specific number that you think the minimum wage should be? I, I don't have a specific number, but I think people should have a living wage in this country. You know, people should have, be able to feed themselves. Right now, is it that 35% of Americans um, could not, get, do not, are not making enough money to pay for basic human needs? And that means food, transportation, and housing. And that means those Americans are sitting on the precipice of, a, you know, of a cliff that they're inches away from or on top of, of becoming homeless. And that is, uh, you know, that's a catastrophe for our country. So we have to yeah. figure out ways if, if raising the minimum wage is one of the ways that we insulate them or, you know, or, uh, or improve those or mitigate those outcomes, we ought to be doing that. Yeah. Well, to your point about, you know, when we had a, a growing middle class, when we had shared prosperity, part of that picture was much higher union density. And I know you've been a vocal supporter of, you know, the writers are on strike right now, vocal supporter of labor unions in general. I wanted to get more specifics for you on what you would do to help rebuild union density and union membership. As you know, right now, the system is so rigged against workers, it's so difficult for them to even uh, exercise their rights to collectively bargain, exercise their rights to form a union. And do you support things like the PRO Act? Are you at all interested in like the sectoral bargaining that Gavin Newsom has been um, experimenting with in California and that other countries do as well? What's your, what are your views there? I mean, we need to build, rebuild unions in this country because the, it's one of the key ways that we can counterbalance this, um, you know, the, the, uh, the domination of our government by corporate power, the unions have always, when I was a kid, 45% of the labor force was unionized. Today, it's less than 10%. Right. And that was a counterbalance to, you know, to, to corporate power at the national level. And now that is kind of, is gone. Even the unions that are active are not uh, participating in the way that they used to in, um, in politics and the political system, which they need to get to be involved, and uh, I, you know, I, I want we need to we need to protect collective bar bargaining. I don't, you know, the the right to work while laws are uh, are damaging to that. I oppose those, and I support you know in any way that makes sense of of growing the strength of of you know worker solidarity, sir. I've noticed uh, you've gotten quite a bit of support recently for uh, Tramath Palihapitiya, David Sachs. Uh, you had the Twitter spaces with Elon Musk, um, and there's at least some of these people are supporting your campaign. Given your uh, support amongst them, how are you going to approach technology companies and whether they should be broken up or not? 
well, oddly enough, you know, like the the conversation I had with Jack Torsey this morning was exactly along those lines. And, you know, I'm impressed that, and I know a lot of people don't feel this way about Elon Musk and Jack Torsey, but I really find them incredibly patriotic and incredibly committed to democracy. And, you know, I didn't, a lot of those activities and their behavior was kind of obscure to me while I was on the, I've been on the other end of the censorship. But I did take note very early on in the pandemic that when the White House and Adam Schiff were asking the tech companies to censor people like me who were challenging, you know, a lot of the orthodoxies, that the one company that stood up was Twitter. And I also, you know, although um, Elon Musk is now vilified from the left by the left which he shouldn't be, he should be, you know, to me, he's a hero. He's a guy who, who came in and, and restored a uh, free, uh, free expression on Twitter. And, you know, that I, I think the left sees that and they say, well, you're at, you're letting Donald Trump talk now. And, but that was not his intention. His intention was to let everybody talk, you know, be, because he made that choice he lost billions of dollars. And, you know, he said to me in our conversation, when I asked him about that, he said, it's worth every penny that I lose because we need free speech in America. Because if we don't have free speech in America, we don't have democracy in America. And if we don't have democracy in America, it's the end of the world. And I feel like he feels that way and that he's going to be a good ally for me when I'm in office and that Dorsey is too because they have this very, very natal commitment to free speech. And I think they saw these, you know, I mean, you guys remember we were all promised at the, you know, at the outset of the, when the social media was selling itself to us, that it was, it was going to become the instrument. It was going to democratize communications around the world. And instead they become the instrument for totalitarian control. And it's very ironic, but I do think that, you know, some of these guys, at least the ones that I'm talking to, including David Sachs, are absolutely committed to, you know, to figuring out how to make censorship proof um, social media sites. And they're doing that with Noster. You know, Noster, I think, yeah. is the right. first one. And I think that's really promising. And some of this blockchain technology that's coming out of Bitcoin will be very, very useful. And by the way, you know, I understand that some of my fellow liberals don't like Elon Musk because they think he's giving a voice to Donald Trump and to some of the, you know, Donald Trump supporters. Well, let, let me speak I, to that a little I, bit. I just want to remember, remind you this. In 1977, there was a march by Nazi, by the Nazi, American Nazi Party in Skokie, Illinois, through a Jewish neighborhood. And the liberal infrastructure, including the ACLU and everybody else, turned out to support their right to march. Right. And nobody is agreeing with what they're saying. What they're saying is appalling and repulsive and repellent. Uh, but, you know, we need to be willing to die in our country for their right to say those things. Because if somebody can censor them, they can censor the rest of us, too. And that's just going to end up, you know benefiting the oligarchy and the military industrial complex. Well, it's uh, we actually interviewed Jack Dorsey yesterday, so this is really relevant. And, you know, I'm on the left and I support free speech and anti-censorship as well. I supported bringing Donald Trump back onto Twitter. What has concerned me about Elon Musk's leadership is the places where he hasn't met his free speech commitments. And I'll give you a few specific examples. Um, when he censored journalists who were critical of him, um, when he uh, bent to demands from the Turkish government ahead of a critical election there to censor journalists who were digging into you know, what, the, the, um, what Erdogan was up to, um, also bending to requests from the Modi government in India as well. So uh, what do you say to those critiques of Elon Musk that he actually hasn't lived up to his commitment and his stated principle that he is in favor of free speech absolutism? Well, I, you know, I'm not going to, you know, my job is not to defend Elon Musk. But I, I would bet you this, Crystal, that if you asked him 
those questions that he would have a pretty good answer for them. And I, and I can guess that part of it, you know, I, I don't know why he censored the people who were criticizing him. I know that he did respond to that, but I don't recall what his response was. But I, one of the things that Dorsey talked to me about this morning was the difficulty of operating in foreign countries and mm -hmm. in, you know, now all across Europe where they're demanding censorship. Right. And so you have to make a choice in some of these countries. And, you know, um, Turkey is uh, is not a freedom of speech country. Um, you have to make a choice. Am I going to continue to operate this institution in this country and bring some of the benefits that it does and the revenue to, you know, my shareholders and my company? Right. Or am I going to, you know, make a stand here and die on this hill and, and, uh, and, <laughs> and, you know, report the truth and then be shut down the next day. So I, you yeah. know, I don't, I don't know what he would say, but I can imagine that those are some of the really difficult choices he was he was forced to make. Yeah, well, that is actually what he did say in response, uh -huh. is that his commitment to free speech goes as far as the lo laws of a certain country provide, which uh, raises a lot of questions. This is actually what Jack Dorsey brought up with us yesterday, is that he, when Dorsey was head of Twitter, he tried to take a more global approach. This is in his words. So he received requests from the Indian government. They either threatened or actually did raid his offices, according to him. They pulled staff from the country and were, you know, concerned about operating there. But they didn't accede to the demands. So um, what is your view of the way that those things should be handled? Because, you know, if you look at any sort of totalitarian government, they're going to have egregious anti-free speech laws on the books is the responsibility of someone who claims to be a free speech advocate to stand up to those governments or just to abide by whatever the law is and whatever that authoritarian government demands? Yeah, I, Crystal, I think that's a really good question and it's a really troubling issue. And I think the, um, you know, right now, um, it, it's becoming more and more difficult because there are competitors within those countries um, that, that have the ability to completely replace, you know, institutions like Twitter, where we're no, the, 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 the Twitter and, you know, some of these other social media companies are now no longer all powerful. You know, if you go to China, there they got each one of them has competitors there. And if you drive the American companies out, you know, is the country going to be and is free speech? Um, more likely to be protected or not. I don't know. I think all of the, I, I don't think at this point, there's probably any hard and fast answer. And I suspect, although I'm not an expert on this, that Jack Dorsey, it was an easier decision when he made it than it probably is for Elon today because of the change landscapes of social media and the, and the growth of indigenous co um, companies within those, uh, within those, you know, I'd say tyrannical systems. Sir, just two last questions for you. I'm curious what your view is of corporations like Bud Light getting involved in Pride Month and in trans issues. I, I would say those are uh, those are um, strategy choices for them. And my understanding of Bud Light is that they probably regret having made that choice because there was such a strong consumer reaction. And that's probably the best way to work things rather than, you know, for them to make, you know, their own decisions about mm -hmm. um, about how to operate and, you know, how, how to keep their consumers. I mean, listen, I, I would love companies to do the right thing on the environment, e even if it's against their economic interests, you know, um, and I'd love it if we had law, but I, it's not, it's not a reliable, uh, it's, it's not a reliable way to change policy is to, you know, you need, you need laws that are actually enforceable that, um, that, in, that do what, you know, what laws in a democracy are supposed to do, which is to encourage support and reward good behavior and then to punish bad behavior. Sure. And, and then uh, if we want to do it in a reliable way, we need it to do it through legislation rather than to rely on, on, you know, corporate goodwill. If, yeah. so, if corporations want to act in ways that are sociable, I, you know, I commend them, but. 
Can't rely on that. Yes, certainly. Point yeah. well taken. <laughs> Last question on my pet issue uh, that I know a lot of people want to know. Uh, will you declassify all UFO-related documents as president? Yeah, let me ask you something. Oh, please. Yeah. Did you see this article um, last week about the guy, about yes. the, the military? Yeah, we've covered it extensively here, yeah. And do you think that that was a PSYOP or do you think that that was real? I, I believe it was real uh, based upon a lot of credible people who I know who have spoken with him and have vetted him. Um, okay. What do you why, think? Why don't you, yeah. why don't you tell people what we're talking about? Sure, sure, yeah. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, Dave Grush, who's an intel whistleblower, came forward through the intelligence community process. He says that uh, multiple alien spacecraft are in the possession of the United States government. The uh, inspector general of the intelligence community says that he is highly credible and has bringing forward urgent information, and uh, actually several representatives in Congress were asked about it uh, just 30 minutes or so before you and I spoke, and many of them, including Senator Gillibrand, Senator Hawley, bipartisanship, if you will, uh, all said that they were uh, credible and that they had asked um, the Congress or they had asked the intelligence community about that and were, uh, it quote unquote, rang true, at least in some cases. Yeah, well, I can't wait to be president of the United States and and dig into that one. That's really... That is fascinating. And really what is your what is your view of the UFO phenomenon? Just per, your personal. Well, view? I don't really. I mean, I don't know anything about it other than I'm very, very good friends with um, with Dan Aykroyd, who's kind of devoted his life to studying that phenomenon, and is you know very, very convinced of it. But I've never seen a <laughs> UFO. And uh, but you know, I also. The stuff that I've read, you know, of people, you know, the, particularly the Navy pilots who have, you know, who have recorded these encounters seem, uh, you know, <coughs> I, I'm not, I'm certainly not going to dismiss it. It seems like it's real, but I don't have, a, I don't have a, <laughs> a good, uh, a good grasp on it. But I mean, that, that article you were talking about was fascinating because it was just exactly what men in black said is actually happening that, you know, they, they gave us Velcro and all of this, That's this right. other, that, uh, yeah. So I, yeah. Well, I always say, I mean, I try to keep the skeptic hat on and say, it's hard for me to imagine that they'd be able to have this cover up across multiple governments, across multiple decades, administrations, all these years. But I have a feeling you might dispute the possibility of such a cover yeah, up occurring. Exactly. Especially what happened yeah. to your own family. Uh, yeah. Sir, I know your staff says you got to get out of here. So I just want to say thank you very much for joining us. It was really a pleasure to uh, speak with you again. And you are welcome back on the show anytime. Love talking to you. Thank you. Oh, sir. I, I love coming on the show. So thank you very much for having me. Thank yeah, you, sir. It's our pleasure. Hey, guys, if you like that video, go to breakingpoints.com, become a premium subscriber, and help us build the best independent media organization on the planet. That's right. We're subscriber-funded. We're building something new. We want to replace these failing mainstream media organizations. So, again, to subscribe, it's breakingpoints.com.